Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining today. We'll continue with our uh, uh, Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, the last couple of chapters. Uh, and so let's just pray and get started. I'll begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and strength uh, that you've helped us, Father, to come to the last couple of chapters here. And uh, Lord, uh, as we read the scriptures of God, we pray that, Lord, you will help us understand it uh, accurately by your Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray, let the word of God, um, Lord, impact our lives powerfully, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the book of Hebrews. We thank you for the truth uh, that brings to us. Thank you, Lord, that, uh, Lord, we will know the truth, Lord, and the truth will set us free. Thank you for the freedom um, and, uh, oh God, the transformation in our lives, Father, even as we receive your word, Lord, and, and are changed by it. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go back to Hebrews 12. We read out a section, but we didn't fully explain. So it was from verse 14 to verse 17. We looked at two uh, scriptures there. Let me uh, go back to verse 16. That we did not explain. Verse 16 and 17, I will read it. So it says, uh, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. So some serious... consequences. Or how did uh, how was this by God that to ask? And we've seen God's evaluation in verse 16 and 17. Is very strong or prof uh, about Esau doing these things, but still very strong words are being used about him. Fornicator or profane? Why, why is he uh, being called these terms? You see, the problem is his unbelief. Okay, and for unbelief, unbelief but how do you know that old, something very precious which would be his birthright now in that culture people will understand that birthright uh, what and also you know Foolishly, when he did not value, he did not hold it as precious, which hurt God. And that showed that Esau had his uh, desire for other things, worldly things. And uh, that Esau's faith in God and what God wanted to give him was very weak. Okay, So that is why we said that he acted in unbelief. And see, how the uh, 
try to put so that act though it sounds very simple it's not that simple it reflects on how esau understood and valued what god had placed on his life okay and that is why god was so upset with him his unbelief fleshly uh, and his choice hurt god so much that we see god uh of faith right that is so yeah. too watered diligently with tears and uh, so it's a reminder for us we are all who have our spiritual our opportunity to partake of the divine nature of god there are many things and our call of god now if we exchange these precious things for things of the world and we say no i don't want it i don't want the gifts of the spirit i don't want the call of god i'll just do this right so that is very similar to what esau did and notice how it offended god that this man said no to god's blessings god's inheritance god's call god's vision and he settled for some passing uh, you know passing benefit of the world uh, and so for us as spiritual people that shouldn't be the case we cannot exchange worldly things for godly things and that does not please god at all that's the point that's how we can apply it in our lives that whatever godly things are there in my life i'm going to value it i'm going to give it my best okay no exchange no question of exchanging it for any passing pleasure or thing of the world so that's how we apply it in our lives that was the sin of esau exchanging worldly things for godly things okay so uh yeah we'll keep moving on if if there are questions please to ask um i just have a question from verse 14 where it says uh, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the lord so people might use this verse and say that if you don't pursue peace you might not even get into heaven because it says without which no one will see the lord so uh, but we do know that when we believe in jesus and uh, even if you are angry even if you don't pursue peace uh, always uh, you're still going to get into heaven so how do we uh, interpret this term over here without which no one will see the lord so the approach that you are taking is correct uh, jeffina you are evaluating it on the basis of other scripture so you already said we already know that we will enter heaven because uh, if we confess our sins god is uh, faithful uh, you know to cleanse us from uh, all unrighteousness so we know that 1 john chapter 1 verses 7 through 9 there is forgiveness now there are many scriptures that talk about it you know the blood of jesus that washes away the the sins of the world so we can we can so many scriptures and establish that yes even if a believer makes uh, some mistake in his journey as long as he is repenting there is forgiveness for that and so it will not stop him from entering heaven we've established it so then we have to interpret this scripture in the light of the truth 
that has been established. So obviously, this is not when it says which no one will see the Lord. It is not saying that we cannot enter heaven, right? So that point is clear cut. Then what does it mean? It could. Mean that they may uh, you know I I'm I'm looking at it that way that no one will see the Lord might simply mean our understanding of God could be marred anything about Esau very strong no uh, it's I've always thought about that. Wow. So unfortunate that this had to happen. Anyway, we learn a lesson uh, from it, a spiritual lesson. Uh, and let's go to the next section here from verse 18 to 24. Could somebody please unmute and read? Hebrews chapter 12 verses 18 to 24 for you have not come to the mountain that may be uh, touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words can you couldn't hear me okay i'll just from verse 18 to 24 yeah uh, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that words should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded and if so much as a beast touches the mountain it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable com company of angels. to God the thank you Jafina I think there was a slight lag in the um, voice but that's fine uh, because anyway yeah, we, yeah? Uh, uh, pastor we, you know, we are losing in between pastor yeah oh like you're losing you. uh, both of us yeah. maybe the network over here we'll just fix it please give me a moment sorry about that sure, sure. yeah thank you thank you okay so I'm sure now it will be better. Um, sorry about those interruptions. We'll come back to the section from uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24. Uh, and uh, here there is a reference to Mount Zion and the experience of God's people at Mount Zion. We can trace it back to Exodus chapter 20, uh, where Israel saw the glory of God on Mount Sinai. One second. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, Mount Sinai. So the uh, blackness and the fire and all of that that is being described here, which happened, uh, you know, at Mount Sinai. And uh, he is telling us that now the people have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. So it's just a way in which he's explaining that now people are a part of the new covenant because the mount sinai experience was one with a lot of fear and uh, 
people understood that they could not keep the command of God on their own. They needed an empowering. And now when he switches to Mount Zion, he is referring to the new covenant and how things have changed uh, under the new covenant. And so he says, when we come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels, the reference is more to the new covenant and how things have now changed under the new covenant. And then he says to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. So it's describing um, the the uh, you know different different assemblies, okay? That that God rules and reigns over, uh, specifically you know heavenly Jerusalem uh, or or heaven where. You know, God rules and reigns to an innumerable company of angels. We know that there are heavenly hosts who serve the Lord and uh, general assembly or along with the angels, several uh, hosts of heaven and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. So the church of the firstborn, uh, in other words, just the church, the believers, we are the church of the firstborn. Uh, but notice he says registered in heaven. So that's another reality that though we are here on earth, our membership right, is in heaven or our registry is in heaven. Uh, so that is a spiritual reality to accept. And then to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. So he's reminding us that we are now part of the new covenant and uh, so many things have changed. We don't approach God with the kind of fear that the people under the old covenant uh, met him with. So in verse 24, he is talking about Jesus. He says, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And we know that the blood of Jesus is stronger than the blood of bulls and goats. We've seen so much that the blood of Jesus has actually done for us. And it forgives our sins. It just does not cover, but it takes away our sins. And this is the kind of work that Jesus has done on the cross for us. So when we now approach God, so it's as simple as that in that section, it's talking about approaching God under the old covenant, approaching God under the new covenant. And when we approach God under the new covenant, we have the assurance of the forgiveness of sins and we can come freely, we can come boldly. Moving on to the last section of chapter 12, verse 25 to 29. Could somebody please pick, pick this up and read it? Therefore, since we have a, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Thank you, John. Uh, the first part of that, we uh, maybe we couldn't hear it from verse 25. So let me just read those yeah, sorry, two. So I'll, I'll read from 25. Oh, okay. Yeah, please. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they do, did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Yes, thank you, John. We can see in the earlier verses, it's a warning. He says, when God has spoken, how can we reject him? Uh, and that's quite clear. 
in verse 25 and 26. Now we can just move on to the next set of scriptures here. He's talking about the removal of things that are being shaken and then the establishing of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So we could understand this as, um, you know, the rule and reign that God is finally going to establish at the end of uh, an end of time. Right? We know that there's after the second coming of Christ, there will be the thousand year millennial rule. And then after that, you know, we will we will see uh, the judgment as well as the formation of the new earth, the new heavens. So the things that are not of God, those things will be removed and the things that are of God will be established. So it's kind of a lot is being said in those few verses but there is a reference to this timeline as god is going to perform many things you know during that period of change and verse 28 where he says therefore since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken uh, we can also look at it as currently as being part of the kingdom of light which also is is stable uh, and you know it, it's a kingdom that cannot be shaken now we are part of that kingdom and we are also going to physically receive at some point this new earth, new heavens. We are going to be a part of that. Uh, he say there's a reference to that as well. So it's both the spiritual as well as the physical, natural aspect. And he says because we are uh, going to participate in these things or there are greater things ahead of us, let's value them. Let's value them. He began in this section by saying, listen to God. Don't disobey God. Okay, Heed the voice of God when he is speaking to us. Don't let go of this faith that you have. And now he's saying, we are receiving valuable things. We are already part of valuable things. We are going to receive valuable things. Therefore, you serve God. But how to serve God? He says, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So there's the answer. How to serve God? To serve God, we need to do it in a manner that God can accept, right? Uh, and having godly fear, meaning doing it the way God wants it. So we are concerned about how God would accept it and then do it according to that. That is godly fear, having godly fear in our hearts so that we, we are uh, focused on ensuring that our ministry is accepted by God. So that's the way we are supposed to serve. Now, because all these wonderful things are ours, and very soon, even in the natural, we are going to see all these things. He says, let's focus on serving God then. Uh, but when we serve God, do it in a manner which is acceptable with reverence and with godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. So he's reminding us that we serve a great God. We serve a, we serve a powerful God and we should never forget that. The last chapter is uh, more of a couple of disconnected instructions here and there and a final greeting. So we can quickly go through it. It's quite self-explanatory actually, but then we will still uh, read through every every uh, verse here and finish the chapter today, chapter 13 of Hebrews. So firstly, we can read from verse 1 to 3. I'll, I'll quickly read it. Uh, it says, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. So as I said, certain disconnected instructions. First is about caring for other believers, uh, having love for other believers. Now we know what kind of love are we to have towards uh, other believers. In the Greek language, Filio. Filio is love for our brother. And that's the love that is used here. Continue brotherly love for one another. So stay as a caring community. Verse 2, uh, be hospitable. 
entertain strangers why is he talking about entertaining strangers because in their culture they had traveling ministers and so people would come down to their uh, uh, city or their their community they'll preach the word they'll serve minister and go back and there was a great need like today we have hotels where people can just go pay stay but those days it wasn't like that so it was important for the people to be hospitable to others so in that setting he's saying you know be hospitable entertain strangers be kind to them help them out uh, and he's also reminding them how when abraham did it back in the book of genesis he actually was entertaining angels and we see this in genesis 18 and genesis 19 uh, and verse 3 where he states if there are prisoners then we must remember them we must help them if there are those who are being persecuted we need to care for them uh, and in this way you know being the body obviously if one part is hurting the other part is supposed to help out so be the body of christ that's the point in these few verses now let's read on i'll only read it uh, because very simple scriptures uh, i'll read from verse 4 to 6 he states regarding marriage one verse verse 4 marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled but fornicators and adulterers god will judge so a lot is said in just one sentence there uh, if at all you know people wondered whether marriage is from god is uh, marriage god's design the writer is clarifying it here yes originally marriage is from the lord it's not a man made idea it is from the lord and it is god who blessed that very first marriage adam and eve and told them gave them the blessing to be fruitful and multiply and uh, along those lines he's reminding the people look marriage is honorable it's pure uh, it it needs to be upheld that way it's a pure thing there are references to you know marriage and the blessings of marriage uh, in several other passages ephesians 5 is a place where we can see how god loves the church and that whole connection uh, the husband how the husband um, uh, sacrifices himself uh, you know and even sacrificially he he loves the wife he nurtures the wife so that whole relationship between the husband and the wife uh, it, it is like the relationship that Christ has with the church uh, and even in the book of Malachi 2 we find references to this relationship of marriage so in the community of believers he's he's helping them understand we need to respect marriage we need to honor marriage you know the boundaries of marriage um, and of course he's talking about fidelity uh, and uh, he says the marriage bed is undefiled uh, and other practices right things like fornication adultery where uh, there is infidelity that's not God's design and uh, he even states that God will judge so there is a consequence serious consequence that follows fornication and adultery uh, and he wanted the believing community to take heed to these things okay so uh, a lesson about marriage over there and how it is so honorable in God's sight it is so pure in God's sight uh, and verse 5 where he says let your conduct be without covetousness be con content with such things as you have for he himself has said I will never leave you nor forsake you verse 6 so we may boldly say the Lord is my helper I will not fear what can man do to me so here he's talking about character and he's talking about the uh, nature of contentment that one can have what does contentment say you know contentment uh, says that what i have i rejoice in it i'm not uh, covetous or you know uh, loving other people's things or loving the more that is not supposed to be mine uh, or you know love for money or uh, let's put it this way uh, uh, lusting for money so he says be free of those things be content with what you have um, and uh, he is then going on to speak about why we should be content 
because we depend on God. And isn't it God who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Isn't it God who said, I have a covenant to provide for you? I am Jehovah Jireh. So he's revealing the nature of God and what God has spoken. And there is a lesson in verse 6 for us. <laughs> Sorry. And that lesson is about declaration. So whenever God says something, when God says, I am the God who healeth thee, what should we do? We should boldly say, my God is my healer. So we are echoing whatever God is saying about himself because that is the truth on which our faith is based. Now, if God says, I am the God of peace, we boldly say, yes, I have peace. God's peace rules and reigns in my heart. I am affirming and declaring what God has already spoken. So in this context, it's about God's provision. And he's telling the believing community, look, when God has already said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, you've got to rise up and say, yes, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. God will provide for you. But you need to have faith and you need to speak your faith that God will provide for you. So be content. Don't be covetous. Know that the, the Lord is your provider and declare that the Lord is your provider. Verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. So this is about um, uh, patterning our lives as per our leaders who have done well. Now, if we look at some of the leaders and we see that you know they, they taught us God's word and we also see their lives, their conduct and how it is godly and how it is um, glorifying and honoring to the Lord. So if you see such leaders, such leadership, then take that as an example and live according to that. Uh, remember those who rule over you, that remember those can mean many things. It can mean pray for them. It can mean, uh, you know, stand with them, support them, help them, whatever. Different ways in which we can be a blessing to those who have been a blessing to us. And here specifically, he is also referring to uh, those who have taught the word of God. Okay, uh, So there were many leaders in the church, isn't it? So those leaders, they taught you the word of God. Remember them and pattern your life after their life of faith. Verse 8, he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Uh, now this, so much can be preached. You know, There are thousands of sermons on it. Uh, it's telling us one reality about God and the Godhead, immutability. Meaning God doesn't change, right? His nature doesn't change. His character doesn't change. It's not going to take a crisis for God to suddenly change and become someone completely different. It will never happen. Immutability. We call it immutability. So Jesus Christ is immutable. Be assured, rest assured. Who he was, he is, he will be to us. And so uh, bank on it. Depend on it. Put your faith on it. Verse 9. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So this is more like the writings to the Galatians where Paul wrote to them. He said, you know, who has bewitched you? You Galatians, uh, you accepted the salvation by faith. And look at you now. You're going after circumcision. You're going after practices and rituals and different things. Uh, don't do that. Let your heart be established. Over here it says in grace. Because it is by grace that we have salvation uh, through faith. And not because of the works that we do. So remain in that place of believing God and believing him the right way. And if there are other doctrines that uh, force us to depend on our works or you know there can be all kinds of teachings right which are not uh, in accordance with what has already been taught as the doctrine let go of those things and he calls them various and strange doctrines do we have various and strange doctrines today of course there are lots and lots and there are new new ones coming up every day okay but let's not get distracted let's not uh, Scriptures also talk about every every wind 
uh, of of doctrine so new things will keep coming strange things will keep coming but may our hearts be established in the truth so strong that we are even able to recognize what is untrue so be established in that way be established in grace be established in the new covenant verse 10 we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat so he is basically talking about salvation so obviously uh, spiritually when we now belong to christ it's different from those who are just practicing temple rituals right they are not part of the spiritual kingdom of god so that's what he's referring to we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat verse 11 for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp therefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach for here we have no continuing city but we seek the one to come therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to god that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name but do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices god is well pleased so he's just Uh, reminding us of the lord jesus and how he died for us and how his blood uh, washes away our sins and how we now have salvation and he also talks about the reproach that jesus suffered the shame that he suffered uh, outside of the gate or you know in the city in the city so we as god's people may go through certain things uh, as opposition or persecution in the city among the people of the community but always remember jesus and always remember you know what salvation truly is and then we will be able to overcome these things and uh, to keep our focus he he talks about um, a city which is to come so what does this refer to we could say for the jewish people it was the anticipation of that promised you know the the boundaries of the land and fully uh for them to be able to occupy it it's it refers to that but in a spiritual sense it also refers to uh, the time to come and finally the city of god that we are all going to be a part of and you know we we are all going to enjoy god's presence in that city so he it's it's like a prophetic uh pointing out over there right uh, and then he states uh, verse 15 about uh, praising the lord and he and he says the sacrifice of praise to god when does praise become a sacrifice when we don't feel like praising okay then it's a sacrifice so he understands that there will be circumstances when we don't feel like praising but even in the in such situations praise the lord sacrifice of praise to god and he says that is the fruit of our lips we can offer something some offering we can give to the lord and that is our praise giving thanks to his name so we can use our lips to praise the lord verse 16 do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices god is well pleased so do you notice there are so many disjointed instructions little bit about brotherly love and marriage and you know hospitality and uh, now trusting god and praising god so let's uh, read the next few verses verse 17 onwards obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you so this is to obey the leaders uh, more specifically his references we could say that it is towards the church community church leaders and he says be submissive okay so, or uh, listen to them uh, understand them and wherever required right you obey them obey them why because they are fulfilling a responsibility and what is that responsibility the responsibility of a shepherd 
what does a shepherd do shepherd will protect shepherd will nurture shepherd will guide so they are fulfilling that responsibility over the lives of the believers and so we have to give them that due respect as our shepherds be and don't make it difficult for them that's his point when he says let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you so make it easier for your leaders to uh, serve you well verse 18 pray for us for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably so it's just a request for prayer to live right for the lord verse 19 but i especially urge you to do this that i may be restored to you the sooner so uh, there is a desire to visit the people and that he's talking about that restored to you is nothing but you know be able to come to see you again uh, and that is a desire that he keeps and the last section is a final exhortation it's like a conclusion and an exhortation so he says now may the god of peace who brought up our lord jesus from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do his will working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through jesus christ to whom be glory forever and ever amen and i appeal to you brethren bear with the word of exhortation for i have written to you in few words know that our brother timothy has been set free with whom i shall see you if he comes shortly greet all those who rule over you and all the saints those from italy greet you grace be with you all amen so he's just concluding with blessings and uh, you know he he kind of uh, states a couple of things he commits the believers into the hands of god who is the god of peace and the shepherd who gave his own blood for us and uh, uh, it is god who has the ability to make us complete in every good work to do his will he's also working in us to do what is well pleasing in his sight okay, so he states these things and finally he makes a comment about timothy so there is a news that timothy uh, is imprisoned and that uh, that he would be released so he states that uh, and uh, he is hopeful to see the believers shortly he concludes with greetings to the leaders and all the believers so that's how the book actually ends many different things okay so i know it's not really flowing uh, but yeah things separate instructions that we can take from here so with that we wrap up the book of uh, hebrews and uh, we will move on to the next set of books um let's do the book of james okay there we can do james and then we can do first and second peter finally jude uh, so in the next couple of books we will not read scripture by scripture we i'll just give you uh, a summary of the sections uh, and so we should be able to cover them quite quickly so uh, let's wrap up then with a word of prayer could uh, somebody please lead in prayer let's pray father we thank you for this lesson that we've had today lord we thank you for the gift that you've given us through our lecturer teaching us and walking us through the scratch and the nuts of the book of hebrews lord i do pray that let us only not be here us but also the doers of the word okay uh, brother lupega unable to hear you okay. Yeah, I think you're muted now. I'm sorry I was using I'm using a same phone that is when they call me locally here. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. No no problem. Would would you uh, I mean if you don't mind could you just pray once more? We couldn't okay, hear you. 
Okay, let's pray again, hoping that they won't call again. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you for this lesson that we've had, Lord. We thank you for the lecturer that has helped us pass through the book of Hebrews. Lord, we know that we are not supposed to only be hearers, but also doers of the word. Lord, as you know that in this book, we've learned about the heroes of faith. Lord, let us also pick examples so that we can put it into our practice, also teach those who are coming before us and those who are listening to us so that we can edify people for the glory of his own kingdom. Lord, we do pray as we go next time to the book of James, we shall also be here alive and kicking in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lubega. What a way to close off Hebrews with two prayers. Okay, so we close with two Thank prayers. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Now we'll connect as we study other books later.